Scott had a ringside seat uh, to some of the most seminal events uh, in Southeast Asia, as well as in the bilateral relationship. He arrived in the Philippines just as the Marcos dictatorship was uh, being overthrown by the People Power Revolution. He also served in Hanoi uh, starting in 1993, helping the State Department uh, open an office to prepare the way for diplomatic ties that would be established in 1995. He served in Indonesia from 2010 to 2013, which is really the golden era of U.S.-Indonesia relations. Um, under Presidents Obama and Yudhoyono, a time when for the first time ever, uh, the leaders of both countries had experienced living in the other country and bought great affection for their bilateral partner, created a comprehensive partnership. And in Myanmar from 2016 to 2020, he witnessed the horror of the genocide perpetuated by the country's military against the minority Rohingya population that ultimately uh, led to the exodus of over 70, 750,000 people. So imperfect partners benefits from insights gleaned from Scott's participation uh, in such events and contained some really fascinating vignettes about his uh, personal experience, such as visiting the presidential palace the night that Marcos departed uh, Manila for the U.S. and watching Filipino citizens uh, help themselves to some of the luxury goods they found inside, uh, singing karaoke with the Indonesian defense minister, um, as well as visiting um, IDP camps in Myanmar and interviewing uh, Rohingya who had lost everything, including hope. But Imperfect Partners is much more than a series of vignettes and personal reflections as books by ex-ambassadors and officials uh, often are. It's also an extremely well-researched and comprehensive account of US ties with the 10 countries of Southeast Asia and ASEAN since the uh, World War II period. Um, and it includes really fascinating policy debates. Um, for example, in the Vietnam case, how much progress on the POWMIA issue was needed before diplomatic relations could be opened or in the period when Myanmar was opening politically, how much reform was necessary before the US could open diplomatic relations or lift certain sanctions. So, and it concludes with a chapter on recommendations for improving the partnership. So in short, it is an excellent account of US-Southeast Asian relations. It's the best one to come along in years. I can't recommend it highly enough. And the floor is now yours. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. And thanks to the Weatherhead Institute and Columbia for, for having me here. It's, um, it's really a pleasure. Um, I, like most Southeast Asia hands, I want to begin by reminding everybody um, of how important Southeast Asia is, something that I spent a lot of time in government uh, explaining to people or arguing to people. Um, the 11 countries of Southeast Asia account for almost 700 million people and collectively would be the world's fifth largest economy, and the US fourth largest export market. Uh, it's an incredibly diverse region. Uh, and one that geographically half of Southeast Asia, the northern half, uh, is in between China and India, and the southern half straddles the key trading routes, the most important trading routes in the world. And it's also a very dynamic place. Uh, economy's been growing really rapidly. It's got a young population in contrast to most of North Asia. And so this is a really important region in its own right, and one that I think is going to become more important going forward. As Anne-Marie was nice enough to say, I ended up spending a lot of my career in Southeast Asia or working on Southeast Asia, grew to really love the place. And, and you know, one caveat up front, um, even though I've spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia and lived in four different Southeast Asian nations, that doesn't make me a Southeast Asian expert. Uh, because there are so many countries and they are so different. Uh, I, I think be wary of the label Southeast Asian expert. <laughs> um, the book, as Emery said, I look at some of the key U.S. relations uh, with the countries of the region and the region as a whole. 
Um, the book covers a lot of ground, uh, including quite a bit of history, because I'm a big believer in that understanding the history, at least the recent history, is key to understanding what's happening right now. Um, and in that light, what I want to do today is talk about five current hot issues in Southeast Asia that, in my view, are best understood in the context um, of the recent history. And then I'll briefly go through another five points, the key points, I think, that should govern or uh, key principles that should guide the U.S. approach to Southeast Asia going forward. So the five, is, five issues, the Philippines, just a few days ago, uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin were in the Philippines for the first ever cabinet level two plus two meeting with their Philippine counterparts. Uh, it took a place at the same time the U.S. and the Philippines were having their largest ever bilateral military exercise, the Balakitan exercise. And as the United States and the Philippines were agreeing on increased access uh, for U.S. forces um, to uh, a number of Philippine bases under the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. And um, even though the, this was not about China. The Chinese ambassador to the Philippines thought that the most useful thing he could do would be to send a very, fairly uh, thinly veiled threat to the Philippines by saying that you stay out of Taiwan business um, if you know what's good for the 150,000 Philippine workers in Taiwan. Um, not an approach as a former diplomat that I would recommend. Um, but to understand what this means, I think it is important, at least briefly, to go through the history of the U.S.-Philippine relation. I'm not going to go back to the colonial era, although that's important. But um, as Anne Marie said, I arrived in the Philippines in 1985 at the end of the Ferdinand Marcos Sr. era, um, which both dates me, but is also relevant given that his son, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., is the current president. And at that time, the U.S. viewed the Philippines very much in the context of the Cold War. Those were the Cold War days, and it was either you were on the U.S. side or you were on the Soviet side, although there were some non-aligned. The Philippines was a very important ally that was home to two, well, several U.S. bases, but particularly two very large U.S. bases, Subic Naval, Subic Naval Base and Clark Air Base. Um, and we had supported President Marcos for many years. But it was clear by the time I got there that Marcos had become more of a problem than a solution because of corruption, economic mismanagement, and the like. Or you had a rising communist rebellion. Uh, you had an uh, insurgency in the Moro area in, in Mindanao. Um, and you had growing unhappiness and discontent over the extent of Marcos's corruption and human rights abuses. So. People power revolt happened. Uh, Marcos was thrown out. It was a huge victory for democracy. Filipino people returned their country to democracy. A few years later, with the end of the Cold War and the Filipinos feeling perhaps a little bit of resentment toward the U.S. support for Marcos all of those years, um, we in the Philippines could not reach agreement to renew our bases. So we lost those key bases. And it was important because at the end of the Cold War, frankly, U.S. policymakers didn't value those bases as much as they would have during the Cold War. Now, fast forward after over the next couple of decades, really, there was a struggle in Washington and I think in Manila. You know, what, what is this alliance? We still have an alliance, but what's it about? There's no longer a Soviet Union. China had not yet risen to the extent it has now. And the Philippines was viewed to a certain extent as the sick man of Asia. It wasn't doing well economically or politically, although it was still democratic. Um, and to a certain extent, the relationship is, since then has depended in part on who's in power in Malacanang Palace in Manila. So you had uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo where for a few years. She supported the war on the U.S. war on terror. Remember those days? Um, but then things soured a little bit, and she began uh, more of a flirtation with China uh, for a whole host of reasons. Um, then you had 
uh, Noino Aquino, Cory Aquino's son, who was elected president. And that coincided with Barack Obama's presidency and the so-called rebalance or pivot uh, to, to Asia. And it also coincided with the Chinese becoming very assertive and aggressive in the South China Sea, particularly in Scarborough Shoal in 2012, where they basically forced Chinese fishing vessels out. All of these factors led the US and the Philippines to reach agreement on the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, which was a new form of alliance, not with US bases, but with enhanced US access to Philippine bases in return for US agreeing to invest in the infrastructure of those bases. Then, because things always change in the Philippines, you had the, uh, the presidency of Rodrigo Duterte, who didn't like the United States very much and made that very clear. Um, and so he turned to China and the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement basically stalled uh, for, for several years. Um, by the time he, uh, the last year, things had begun to warm up again. Then you had the election of Ferdinand Marcos Jr., Bong Bong Marcos, who I met in 1985 when we were both, let's just say young. Um, and um, he has moved ahead to implement this enhanced defense cooperation agreement for a number of reasons. One of which, and this is me speculating, um, because the Chinese, for reasons I don't fully understand, have been very aggressive in the South China Sea, even during the early days of his presidency, which I think has, in a democracy like the Philippines, meant a lot of public support for taking a stronger stance in favor of Philippine sovereignty and in favor of working with the United States, and by the way, and Japan as well. So that's created an opportunity. That's why you have this enhanced defense cooperation agreement moving forward. The last point on the Philippines is, I think it was yesterday, US Trade Representative Catherine Tai was in Manila and highlighted the US interest in expanding the economic relationship with the Philippines, but also reiterated that the United States isn't interested in a free trade agreement. That's a challenge for us. And I'll get back to that later. <laughs> Next issue, um, our other ally, longtime ally, Thailand. Uh, in four weeks, roughly, uh, Thailand's going to have um, its first national elections um, in, in several years. And there's a lot of parties running. I won't go through all of those. But basically what you have is uh, Prime Minister, former General Prayut, who had led the coup in 2014, and a few other generals running. And then you have a number of opposition parties, including the Thai Party, um, uh, formerly of uh, former Prime Minister Aksin Shinawai and a number of other parties, but also many that represent sort of a younger generation. And so in a lot of ways you have in this election, a question of will the military or those affiliated with the military be able to hold on to power? And they have stacked the Senate in their favor, so that's gonna give them a huge advantage. Or will those who want some change uh, be able to come into power? It's going to be really interesting. How does that link to the United States? In brief, you know, we and the Thai were super close during the Cold War, particularly during the Vietnam War. The Thai were very worried about communist expansionism, as were we. So it was a it was a very happy marriage for a lot of years. Um, but after the Cold War, kind of like the Philippines, the question began: what is this alliance for? And in the Thai view, and I'm speaking generally here, they began to ask, what's the value of being the US treaty ally? Because during the 90s and 2000s, without that strategic prism to guide our policy of the Cold War, we began to uh, calibrate our relationships in Southeast Asia based on democracy, human rights, and trade. It wasn't a strategic component. And in the Thai view, we treated them on these issues like we treated non-allies. So again, what's the benefit of being an ally? And really, since the early 90s, there's been a little sense of drift in this relationship. It's not that the relationship's bad. It's just been a sense of drift. Then you connect that back to Thai politics. Beginning with, with toxins rise in the early 2000s, 
um, which generated a lot of opposition for people who saw him as a threat to the traditional Thai politics centered around the monarchy and the army. Um, you've had intense polarization that resulted in two coups, 2006, 2014. We responded not very enthusiastically to those coups. And that's particularly the second one in 2014, we responded quite critically. And the Thai, at least the Thai government and a lot of the Thai elite got pretty frustrated with us. Why don't you understand us? Why don't you understand why we needed this coup? And the truth is, and I was there, I was a principal deputy assistant secretary then. And the truth is mm, we didn't understand why. Um, because it seemed to us, if you've got political polarization, elections are the best way to resolve that. These key Thai figures didn't see it that way. So um, it, it, things cooled off pretty significantly. As Anne-Marie mentioned, we had a lot of interagency meetings in Washington at the time, and a lot of sort of automatic things kick in with a coup, some by law where you have to cut off military assistance, but also there's a lot of forces in and out of government that demand that the U.S. take a really tough stance on that. And those forces are pretty institutionalized, and um, so they, in effect, compel uh, the government to take a pretty tough stance, rightly or wrongly. Um, so the relationship is cold. Thailand's moved closer to China. And there's, in my view, still a lot of residual goodwill on both sides, but a real need to talk to the Thai and figure out how do we redefine this relationship in a way that works for both of us. I'm gonna skip now to um, a happier story involving our former enemy, Vietnam. Uh, I won't go through the history of the Vietnam War, you all know that, but uh, again, even after the war, in addition to the hard feelings from the war, we saw Vietnam, rightly, as a Soviet client state till the end of the Cold War. With the end of the Cold War, the Vietnamese, being pragmatic, saw that they needed to diversify their relationships, and so they were interested in reaching out and engaging with us. Some of us were interested. I happened to be on the Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia desk as a very junior officer at the time. Um, and so we were interested also in engaging with them, less for strategic reasons, and I think a lot more because of feelings from the war. Uh, there were a lot of people who were interested in Vietnam because of the history and also saw working with Vietnam as an essential need in order to reach a peace agreement for camp to end the civil war in Cambodia. So there was a lot of momentum to go forward, but strong opposition from key constituencies, including those who were focused on accounting for our missing servicemen and who felt that Vietnam was not cooperating sufficiently. There were knockdown, dry out fights in Washington. Again, I just happened to be there, uh, almost, I won't quite say an innocent bystander, but someone who didn't have enough cloud or influence to shape things, but at least to, could witness it really hard fought battles. And in the end, the Bush administration came up with a roadmap that we presented with the Vietnamese, where we basically said, if you move forward on these things, Cambodia, POW accounting, um, emptying your re-education camps, these sorts of things, then we will be able to move forward toward normalization. The Vietnamese never accepted it, but in effect, they kind of did. And we were able to make progress over the next few years leading to normalization in 95, um, which was exciting. And, but then the momentum just kept going. And there was a real effort on both sides to keep building this relationship. Trade really led the way, trade took off. And Vietnam's now our 13th largest trading partner, our largest trading partner among the ASEAN region but also because both sides kept working on those issues dating from the war, POW MIA accounting, and on our side, increasingly helping deal with the legacy of Agent Orange and landmines and these sorts of things. Um, over time, security grew into the picture um, as South China Sea issue heated up, but that wasn't the driving force initially. And I have to say, among all Southeast Asian nations that I've dealt with, Vietnam along with Singapore has been the best at working Washington. Some would argue they did a pretty good job during the war too, but set that aside, they've been really good at working Washington 
and making it relatively easy to convince senior U.S. officials uh, to travel to Vietnam and to engage with Vietnam. And so just this week, you have Secretary of State Tony Blinken there. Um, again, in the context of concerns that uh, a number of people in the Vietnamese government who are seen as pro-U.S. Uh, have been have lost their jobs in an anti-corruption campaign. I tend to think that's more about domestic politics and less about uh, U.S. But in my view, nothing's changed in the Vietnamese geostrategic calculation. They have to have a good relationship with China. It's their next door neighbor and a major trading partner. But they've decided since the early 90s, they also want to have a good relationship with us. And so I see this as, as some overreaction by some analysts that, oh, they're leaning now towards China. Um, I think they're going to work with China. We shouldn't have a lot of heartburn about that. And we should have confidence in the relationship. Um, Indonesia. There was recently, a, again, in the context of U.S.-China competition, there was recently a New York Times piece that said that China was winning in the, over the United States in the battle to, to woo Indonesia, the largest prize in Southeast Asia. Um, first, I think the framing of that is fundamentally flawed. None of these countries are prizes to be won. They're all very nationalistic countries that don't want to be anybody's vassal state, and we should remember that. Um, and there's not there's no such thing as winning the prize. It's, this is not a sports contest, uh, right? This is something that takes place over time. Um, for me, there's we need to remember again the history. Indonesia, you know, Sukarno, one of the founders of the non-aligned movement. And that non-aligned mentality is deeply embedded in the Indonesian psyche. I think that's a good thing. I don't see that as a bad thing at all. Um, we should also keep in mind that Indonesia went through this amazing and very tumultuous democratic transformation. Since the U.S. goal is to support democracy, even though it wasn't our victory, we didn't do this. The Indonesian people did. This is still a huge gain uh, for the world and I think for the United States. Um, Zamri said, I, I was lucky enough maybe to be in Indonesia during the golden years when President Obama came and announced a comprehensive partnership with President Yudi Yono. Um, and there's some sense since then that the relationship has underperformed. Um, you can argue about it, but one weakness has been on the trade and investment front. There's not as much trade investment as we would like for a whole host of reasons. Um, trade has been pretty stagnant really over the last decade. Um, U.S. businesses would claim it's because of Indonesian protectionism. There's something to that, but it's it's more than that. Um, and then more recently, there's a sense of Indonesia having moved closer to China. I think there's some truth to that, but I also think it reflects President Jokowi's pragmatism. President Jokowi was elected as a guy who's like, I'm going to build the roads and the ports and the bridges. And who can help me? China. Belt and Road Initiative, whether you like it or not, they're offering something that we, we are not offering. So I think it's very understandable that he's leaning toward China in that sense. Um, I'm not overly concerned about it, other than I want to see the United States up its game. And in that light, the United States, together with Japan, recently announced a $20 billion partnership with Indonesia, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, to help Indonesia retire coal plants, and move toward cleaner energy, because Indonesia is also one of the world's largest emitters of greenhouse gas. This is a huge opportunity, both for the climate part of it, environmental part of it, but also for the United States to up its game, not against China, but just to be a good partner. Um, but we have to see whether the U.S. can deliver. Last, am I running out of time? Okay, Okay. Um, meanwhile. Um, where I spent the last four years of my career. Um, Time Magazine just named Min Online, General Min Online, the leader of the coup and of the Myanmar military as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. My Myanmar friends are just apoplectic about this because he is a horrible man. Um, and, 
Pardon me? Yeah, that's not actually I yes, you're right. But that's not how it's being that's not how it's being seen among my Myanmar friends. So this is the man who led the coup in February 2021. And what we've seen since then, since the coup, is really the equivalent of a national uprising or a revolution against the military. People, I think a lot of people don't appreciate how widespread the support is for this uprising. Myanmar people are united like I've never seen before. They were ruled by the military for 50 or 60 years. And they know how bad it is. And they don't want it anymore. So this is huge. Um, and it's not getting nearly enough attention. Because what's going on there, the scale of the brutality by the military is every bit on a par with what the Russians are doing in Ukraine. Every bit, just horrific atrocities, including a bombing last week that killed about 170 people, men, women, and children, babies, a six-month-old baby. This is sort of what the military does in Myanmar. Um, again, I won't go through all the history, but the U.S., policy since 1988, particularly during, after the student uprising that was brutally suppressed by the military, has been, it's all about supporting democracy and about supporting the right of ethnic minority groups who've been faced discrimination and to a certain extent disenfranchised for decades to, to have more say. That's always been our policy. Um, for a lot of years, that meant sanctions and squeezing the military. Then during the period of reform that began in 2011 and went to 2021, including the five years when Aung San Suu Kyi um, led the government, the elected government, um, we responded to that as I think we should have by going from sanctions and isolation to doing everything we could to try to help the reform movement succeed. And that included a lifting of sanctions in, of all sanctions in 2016, something that I um, argued very strongly for within the government, something for which I still have people who won't talk to me for doing, uh, because there was an argument that you you shouldn't you you removed your leverage from uh, from the Myanmar military. Um, unfortunately, things went horribly wrong in 2017 and afterwards with the Rohingya crisis. Um, which basically involved uh, a series of small incidents by a few Rohingya um, who carried out attacks against security forces. Remember, Rohingya were in a sort of an apartheid-like situation, really appalling situation. Uh, a small number of them took up arms, and that led to this incredible overreaction, disproportionate reaction by the military, as Anne-Marie said, driving 700,000 people out of the country. And... What people in Myanmar are, are kind of quietly not talking about right now is the fact that a large part of the Myanmar population was either didn't believe the atrocities were occurring or didn't seem to mind too much. And it was impossible at that time to get the Aung San Suu Kyi government to actually take strong action against it, which led to a dramatic cooling of bilateral relations. Again, that's now been overtaken by events by the coup. Um, and um, the United States is offering a lot of rhetorical support for the pro-democracy forces. Um, in my view, they should be offering more substantive points. Okay, going forward, what should the United States be doing in Southeast Asia? This will be quick. The relationships between the United States and the countries of Southeast Asia over the last 30, 40 years have been in many ways really good and brought a lot of benefits to both sides. But you don't have to dig too deep either in Washington or in Southeast Asia to, to hear the complaints and the disappointments. From the U.S. point of view, democratic regression, human rights violations won't stand up to China. From the region's point of view is we can't count on you guys to show up. Or when you do show up, you lecture us. Um, and oh, by the way, uh, you pulled out of Trans-Pacific Partnership. So that's your own, um, your own goal, so to speak. So going forward, we should be doing five things. One, show up consistently from the president on down. George W. Bush kind of didn't. Obama did. Trump didn't. Biden is. 
So the question in everyone's mind in Southeast Asia is what happens after 2024? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. It's a real question because it's all about how much confidence do we have that the U.S. is really committed to this region. Um, second, when we show up, don't make it about China. Trust that these countries have agency in their own independence. They know China as well, probably better than we do, except for Tom Christensen. Um, and, um, you know, talk about the issues that matter in Southeast Asia, the positive agenda. As I said, this is a country, a region that's hugely important in its own right if China didn't exist economically, politically, climate change, health. There's lots that we are doing. Those are the things we should be focused on, not talking about China. Third, trade. Got to come up with something. Saying, sorry, our Congress won't approve it. Maybe, you know, maybe a political reality here. It's not an excuse that's going to fly in Southeast Asia. We got to figure this out. Um, fourth, and this uh, my friends in the human rights community won't like, We've got to engage consistently, even when things aren't going well. Pulling back as we did, and I'm partly responsible for this, from Thailand after the 2014 coup. I'm not saying you do business as usual and don't pay any attention to human rights violations, don't get me wrong, but just disengaging doesn't really work, um, particularly these days. One exception, we shouldn't be engaging with the military in Myanmar. They are beyond the pale. Um, and last, Focus on our focus on the younger generation, a lot of dynamism, education, innovation, more money for scholarships and exchanges. And when we talk about human rights and democracy, which we actually want to support, less lecturing and more support for local forces and local individuals and groups that are supporting democracy. I think I went over, but no, thanks. you that was just uh, a wonderful overview. As you can see, he's got the history, the current events, and the uh, and the recommendations. As I said, thank you uh, so much for that, Scott. Um, for those <laughs> for those of you, we're we're going to start taking questions now. For those of you who've joined us online, please put your question in the chat, and I will um, attempt to grapple with that. Um, I'm just going to use my prerogative as chair, and you and I were chatting about this a little bit. Um, I agree with uh, Scott wholeheartedly, right, that Southeast Asian countries are critical independent actors worthy of engaging in their own right. And yet, when I am in a lot of discussions, as I said earlier, with, you know, Washington types, I've been in all of these workshops and track two dialogues. And I hear very influential people say, well, they are going to balance with us against China in the end, therefore they should do it now. And it's, it's, it's almost ingrained in a kind of DNA with a strategic culture of a binary choice. And I realize that your book is a very important way of trying to resist that kind of thinking. Um, how, as somebody who's been inside that world, can we try to break that out other than writing our beds and doing this? Because it's hard to break. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I think the first thing is to listen to people in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, and, and I include myself in that, we're often better at talking. Uh, they're getting our talking points out to our counterparts and listening. Um, I mean, there is a tendency, and I'm sure this is true in many governments, if not all governments, there is a tendency to always to see yourself and your government as a, as a benevolent, positive actor. And certainly that's true in the United States. Now, I wouldn't have served so long in the U.S. government if I didn't think we were generally a positive force. But you can believe that and at the same time recognize that others may not see you as quite the wonderful people and country uh, that you see yourself as. Um, so it's it, it's just listening, I think. And also um, recognizing that for Southeast Asians, trying to go down the US-China versus China path is just a, just a loser. 
right? If I was, God forbid, for the country, if I were in charge of a Southeast Asian country, I'd make sure I had good relations with China. Mm -hmm. Of course. Oh, I would also want to have good relations with Japan and Korea and Australia and the United States. But absolutely, um, there's no reason that they shouldn't. And as I said, China's got plenty of negatives. Um, but Southeast Asians don't need us to educate, quote, educate them on that. They're fully aware. And instead, instead of worrying about what China's doing all the time, we should be worrying about what we're doing. And, and being as positive a force as, as possible. Yeah. I don't know that that answers your question. Well, you know, I was just thinking, and I'll get to the hands in a sec. The uh, a colleague of mine who teaches at the National Defense University, which is obviously run by, you know, DOD, the charge came down this academic year that all Asia courses had to have 50% China content. And this is somebody who had traditionally taught on Southeast Asia. Yeah. So we are educating the next generation of Americans to kind of keep seeing things in that way and not teaching them about the countries in you know, sufficient detail that they can effectively see them as the independent um, agents that we know them to be. All right, uh, who would like to kick us off? Nora, you wanna go ahead? Uh, thank you, I'm going to have to hold it very and so. I have two questions. One is from the other from the other So I'm wondering if and when the community is moving away from the two and so on to what's impossible for the market to do. Is there a way that the rest of the community is just the MLB differently just thinking the game from like the world? I think that the MLB is just in the call, there are a lot of expectations on the MLB and then the same front of the MLB is kind of the how exactly were you care for us to what were you take to our classroom? You know, on one hand, there's a lot of good buildings for like yes, we value at the mentality, blah blah blah, you guys have to touch. But then the actions don't really match that, right? They're like pushing for the indoor specific. Yeah, like you know, going all in with office and things like that. So I guess what you're saying is what exactly is the dissertation is in this. Uh oh. <laughs> I should ask you that question. <laughs> um, okay, on Myanmar. Um yeah, at first, if the forces pro-democracy forces prevail, and when I say prevail, not necessarily a battlefield victory, but sort of put so much pressure on the military that it's compelled to surrender most, if not of the political power. I'm not sure it's a given that the NLD, as the NLD comes back to power, I think we've seen a lot of diffusion of political power now, and um, you know who knows what the, the future lies. But I think what we, what I saw and what we still see to some extent in Myanmar, among the majority of Bama population, including among NLD, is a certain chauvinism. Uh, I think that's just been a reality. And um, I think if there are very few positives have come out <laughs> about this coup, but one of the things that I think it has sparked a lot of new thinking and a lot of discussion and a lot of dialogue among people in Myanmar, including Bama people who, you know, for years listened to propaganda about the ethnic groups as rebels and criminals and so on. Um, and I think increasingly recognizing that that, that things, um, that was not the case. So I think there's more awareness and more sensitivity to that. So I'm I think the, the national unity government and other aligned forces have been working to build trust and and toward some kind of federal system that that would change the way things are ruled. But you know these sort of attitudinal changes. I mean, just look at the United States, right? After how many decades or hundreds of years are we still trying to change attitudes uh, from the majority population toward minorities? So. You hope to see progress, but um, you also need to give it some time. On ASEAN, um, the U.S. has kind of struggled, including me, for years. How do you engage with Southeast Asia? If you want to engage China, you go to Beijing. If you want to exchange Japan, you go to Tokyo. How do you engage Southeast Asia? 
where do you go? For years, it was Singapore. You go, and what does Lee Kuan Yew say? Um, Indonesia, you know, biggest country, but Indonesia doesn't speak for Southeast Asia. And rightly or wrongly, ASEAN as an institution doesn't really speak for Southeast Asia either. So it makes it hard when you're trying to convince senior U.S. officials to engage with Southeast Asia. They say, okay, how many countries do I have to go to, right? It's just the reality. There's no easy hand grip. Um, I think with ASEAN and ASEAN centrality, you're seeing in the case of Myanmar, the U.S. sort of paying homage to ASEAN centrality, even though ASEANs are stuck uh, with a five-point consensus that's failed. And it's failed because you're dealing with generals who aren't reasonable people. Um, so the U.S. Is, is taking that seriously. But I mean, the truth is ASEAN wants centrality, but ASEAN is largely incapable of bold action because of the consensus requirement. How do you get 10 countries to agree on anything, right? And I think people in the region know that. They understand that. So that's fine. And there's reasons why ASEAN has decided to go with that approach. But then you can't complain too much if others set up different institutions or forward to try to tackle problems. I think the key is whether it's Quad or AUKUS or anything else, to have a lot of dialogue with countries in ASEAN, explain, here's what we're doing, here's what it means, here's how we might address any concerns that you might have. And this is not an effort to take away from ASEAN, but it is a way to try to tackle some specific problems. Tom? Thanks for coming, Scott. We had uh, Kathy Stevens and Danny Russell here in the class. Two weeks and uh, this is a great position. So uh it's great to have people from from the AP and um I I wanted to say something about ASEAN and get your reaction to what I have to say about ASEAN because I've said it before and I've seen big debates start uh, over my my statement and that is that ASEAN as you said doesn't get things done but I'm of the opinion that if ASEAN would go away we will miss it terribly that um it plays a certain function for what for what it prevents, not for what it accomplishes. And we would see uh, a bat, a much starker battle between China and the United States in Southeast Asia. If they weren't on Southeast Asia, the area in the coal mine, we can lose, we can't afford to lose it. So we have to stay somewhat moderate in what we do. Um, and then the question is a tough one, but uh, maybe it's not fair because uh, these choices are devil's choices. I can remember when we were both at the State Department. How frustrated the Pentagon was in particular about our sanctions on Thailand. That's what we took out in six years. Um, and there were people at the State Department also wanted to improve relations with the post to government. Um, there were, as you said, these automatic restrictions. And you seem to be saying in your six points that we should always stay engaged even when things go bad. I, I, I gather you think post coup is one of those places when one of those times when things go badly, we say, Largely engaged. Um, but they want to press you on, on your country uh, of expertise, um, Myanmar, Burma, whatever. We call it Myanmar now, everyone. Does everyone call it that? Everyone except the US government. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I, say, I still have to say Burma. I'll tell you why later. So Burma. Um, <laughs> um, uh, um, there were people during the, uh, the ethnic cleansing, the oppression of the Rohingya who said, be careful what you wish for when you pressure on some Sushi's government, because she has no choice but to support this repression because the military wants it and the people back it. And if she opposes it, she will go down the party. Um, so if you pressure her, you're gonna have the Rohingya oppression plus a military dictatorship. So lay off. How would you respond to those people who made that argument? Is it Rohingya repression? I know the current situation is awful in Burma, but the Rohingya repression was also really awful. So how do you balance that? I mean, you're a career diplomat. I was I was on loan for a couple of years. Um, how do you handle that kind of like? Right. Easy question. Yeah, really yeah. easy. I okay. <laughs> no, it's a good question. First, I agree with you on ASEAN. Despite my comment earlier, which I believe, that ASEAN is incapable of bold action, that doesn't mean it doesn't have value. And in the book, I say, you know, you have to accept ASEAN for what it is. And it it does add significant value in terms of managing uh, issues among the ASEAN states, but also as a convener 
of the big powers. So I completely agree with you on that. On Thailand and sanctions, just very briefly, um, again, I don't think you, you know, there's a coup. You don't just, oh, invite the coup leader to the White House the next day. But there's a tendency in the U.S. to kind of pull back really sharply and say, we're not going to engage again until you fix things. And then two or three years go by, and guess what? Things aren't fixed. And then you start engaging anyway. Um, on on um, Aung San Suu Kyi and the Rohingya. Um, I've heard that argument, um, and former Secretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, Teddy Loxon of the Philippines, and I were having a friendly debate on Twitter the other day about this, where he blamed the, the Western pressure on Aung San Suu Kyi for leading to the coup, which I think is absolute nonsense, um, with all due respect. <laughs> um, uh, she, I don't know that she could have stopped the military operation. And she, I am quite confident, was not out there saying, yeah, go kill a bunch of Rohingya and drive them out. I, I, I don't I don't know. On the other hand, she had enormous popularity and influence in the country. And what I think she could have done that she didn't was talk about the issue as, I mean, Rohingya were deeply unpopular in the country, throughout the country. So it was a loser politically. But she has shown in her career enormous courage. And I think she could have shown some political courage to say, look, we're absolutely going to go after those armed Rohingya who carried out the attacks. But if we want to be the kind of country that we say we want to be, we have to treat every human being with respect and dignity, whether or not we think they're illegal immigrants or, you know, quote, belong here or not. And she didn't. And, and over time, when we tried to talk to her about the issue, she basically um, took the line that, that it wasn't, that, that all these allegations of human rights and uh, abuses were greatly overblown. Um, so I, I don't, blame her per se for the operations by the military, but I think for failure to use her political and moral influence to shape how the country as a whole viewed. Okay, we had uh, the gentleman back there in the red and the green. Uh, yes, so I you talking about the very close relations to the after that, the sort of thing that there's a little bit about the country yeah well i mean i think um i i've been in my book and and here you know criticize some u.s things but after the 2014 coup which is when really relations cooled the most um I, I, again the u.s reacted to the coup strongly and i think we were right to a point to do that because the coup was I mean, was against a perfectly legitimately elected government, right? Um, but the Thai didn't help matters. They were extremely difficult. Uh, the government I'm talking about at that time went out of their way to be difficult um, uh, and made really no effort to work on, on the relationship. Um, now, I think relations have, have resumed pretty well. I mean, we saw that we have a huge embassy there. There's still a lot of positive things happening with Thailand economically. We have amazing health cooperation with the Thai, many other areas. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of room for more diplomacy, but not against China. For the simple reasons that the Thai don't view China like we view China. They just don't see China as a threat. Uh, nearly as much. They're certainly aware of the pros and cons of China. So I think working with Thai is possible and, and actually really would be very helpful. Um, and we, you know, of course we are, but it, it wouldn't be, I think, about watch out for China stuff. It would be about a lot of other things in the region and bilaterally. Thank you. The first is uh, the country of Egypt and talk about why. Um, the second question, also, the second question is that at any point, are any of the uh, suggestions that you've given about the following policy ever in conflict with one another? 
And the third question I have is what happens to our community field? Like, what are they doing? Um, good question. Why didn't I talk about some other countries? And, and just on that, there is a question in the chat about the transition in Cambodia, in case you wanted to mm, okay. um, incorporate that. Yeah. yeah. First of all, in the book, I didn't, it's, I state very bluntly in the book that this is not a comprehensive study. So I didn't write chapters on, on every country in Southeast Asia. I wrote mostly on, I wrote basically on countries that I had either lived in or spent an extraordinary amount of time working on. Um, it's not that, so I, there's no chapter on Singapore. It's not because Singapore is not hugely important, uh, of course. Um, one country that I didn't discuss here that I did write a chapter about was Cambodia. Um, and, you know, basically my argument there is that First, every time I go to Cambodia, I think to myself, how does a country that had its soul literally torn apart even function as a society after what the Khmer Rouge did? So that's not to say, therefore, whatever they do is okay, but it, it, I try to remember that and keep that in context. Second, I think the U.S., along with some other countries, invested really heavily in that um, in the Cambodian peace accords and then the untax uh, um, sponsored elections and hope for democracy. And I, I think there's still a lot of unhappiness toward Hun Sen for, in our view, kind of upsetting that and taking control. And then, you know, he's been in control ever since and he's been anti-democratic. Um, my argument is, I don't, I'm not one of these people who says, oh, Cambodia is a lost cause. I don't think you should write off countries. Things change over time. Hun Sen's clearly very close to China. It, it is what it is. Um, but things can change. Secondly, there's a lot of people in Cambodia who we can do, who we can work with and do good things. And, and we all, um, but there's more to do. Third, our approach has been, you know, sanctioning key people, that sort of thing, which, you know, people in Washington love sanctions. Why? We can do it unilaterally. One of the few things we can do. It shows strong moral stance. Um, I'm not opposed in principle to them, but I question their effectiveness much of the time. And in the case of Cambodia, I just don't think it's helpful. I don't see how it's actually advancing anything. Um, and, um, you know, the broader point there is that some people and institutions in Washington, and I don't mean just in government, seem to think that it's still 1991 and the Cold War just ended and we're the dominant players in the world. The world's changed and our tactics have to change accordingly. I'm not saying we don't support democracy and human rights. Of course, that's part of who we are and I think it's an asset for us. But to act like we can kind of just press and, and coerce countries or through punitive action cause them to change their position, I think we got to look really carefully at when that works and when it doesn't. And I find that a lot of times it doesn't, but there's tremendous pressure politically to do it. And watch it. Why haven't you issued a statement? I mean, that's, I heard that in email. I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I heard, why haven't you issued a statement on that? As if that is literally the only tool of diplomacy. There, I'm not saying we never issue statements, but there are other tools of diplomacy. And so, um, as I said, people in their heads realize it, but at the same time, they're saying, make sure China doesn't gain too much influence. Why aren't you out bashing these guys? There's some tension there. And, you know, you have to live with that to a certain extent, but you should at least recognize it. Um, and the last thing on whether any of my suggestions in, are in conflict with one another. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think so. Um, other than, as I said, I don't think we should be engaging the Myanmar generals because they are so far beyond the pale and because there's no evidence in history that engagement with them has caused them to alter their behavior. Okay, and I just, uh, we'll get to the quite, uh, hands here. I just want to make a comment, which is that it's very interesting that in a talk on U.S.-Southeast Asia relations, you began by framing your remarks on political change in different Southeast Asian countries, right? Uh, in the Philippines from 
you know, Marcos and then the keynote of Duterte uh, and now back to Marcos and how those changes had such significant impact on the tenor of U.S. ties. Mm -hmm. Ditto with the tie. And so, you know, this just really supports your point, A, about the importance of engagement because it's not as if the Cold War external factors are uniting or dividing these countries. The domestic political uh, implications are much uh, higher and more salient than I think yeah. they used to be years ago. At least that's what I keep seeing in the literature and you keep uh, pointing out. Um, this gentleman over here. Yeah, I disagree. I want to give him the number yeah, that's a huge question. Um, on Facebook in particular, because it got a lot of attention um, at that time, even be, even before the um, Rohingya crisis. Um, in Myanmar at the time, everybody was on Facebook. In fact, you'd ask people on a regular basis, Marine knows this, you say, do you have internet? And they said, no, just Facebook. Um, so everybody was on Facebook. And as you know, Facebook can be used to deliver all kinds of information, including messages of hate. The criticism of Facebook at the time was that they were not employing enough Myanmar language uh, specialists to monitor the traffic and, you know, pull down um, pull down really problematic, hateful traffic, of which there was quite a bit. So we did engage with Facebook uh, quite a bit. I came back here and, and went to Facebook headquarters and well, like, not to sort of lecture them, but just to sort of say, hey, you know, this is, this is out there. Um, and I think they responded. A lot of people, you know, people have different views on whether they responded sufficiently. More broadly, also on Myanmar, there's a big question now about in the aftermath of the coup, should U.S. companies stay? Not just U.S. companies. I mean, even me and I have friends in Myanmar business who are under pressure to shut down because arguing that anything that you do for business supports the junta. I think this is a really tough issue morally um, because if you're a company X and employing hundreds or thousands of people and you're not involved in politics at all and you're not doing business for the government or for the junta, you know, like... Or, you know, you're in the garment business. The garment business is employing a lot of young women from rural areas who otherwise wouldn't have jobs. It's a really tough issue, right? Do you, you, you may be paying taxes. Probably you are if you're a quality company, you're paying taxes, which you have to do under the law. So you could shut down and then all these people lose their jobs or you pay taxes. I, when I've been asked about this, I say, look, I, I think companies have to make this decision. They have to weigh, you know, the pros and cons. I mean, there's certain things obviously that they should avoid doing, but I think it's a really tough call for U.S. companies and and for other companies. Okay, John. Um, in your, um, thank you. In your comments, you talked about um, the U.S. needing to engage even when we don't like what's going on. You also said we should be focusing more on youth, and in the context of the Thai elections coming up, you're seeing a generational. Uh, battle brewing. And um, if the military decides to use its power to maintain um, its power after the elections, you're going to have an entire several generations of ties going to be very upset um, with that result. And should the, U it, should the US decide to engage with that regime, are we risking losing a generation of ties? Yeah, this is why diplomacy is fun. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, I think I think the U.S. first has to recognize that we don't have a lot of say in what happens in Thai politics, um, right? And particularly these days, where our own democracy is under a fair amount of duress, um, we got to be mindful that you know we we have to be humble in our approach. Um, certainly, in the case that um, let's say an extreme example, but one plausible in given Thai history, where who tie or one of the other parties um, wins and the constitutional court weighs in and says, no, you know, 
they did X, Y, or Z, so they're disbanded. I think we need to, you know, certainly say this is really problematic. Um, my argument is not that we ignore it, but that we continue to engage with any government that emerges, but at the same time, also continue to engage regularly with youth, with other political parties, and so on. So, um, you know, it's it's a challenge. It's really hard. There's no kind of perfect way of doing this. It's an art rather than a science, for sure. Um, so I think you would definitely want to look way, for ways to make your unhappiness and disappointment clear. My point is that you don't just stop talking to the government for the next one to two years. If you thought that really would work and cause it to change its behavior, then it would be worth doing. But in my experience, it, it rarely is. But you balance that with lots of outreach and engagement with uh, youth. And, and there's a lot that you can do to show your support for the concepts of, you know, the concept of democracy and others. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Scott, thank you very much. Um, since you didn't talk about Singapore, can you say a few words about how much leverage do we have with our American interests. I'm talking about Burma, of course. Sorry, that's only the most important country. So the, you know, how much leverage do we America has on um, Singapore? Because after all, it's it it's their banker yeah. and it's their job giver, and I think they're vulnerable, and we never seem to do anything about it. And they're making, you know, Lee Sing Hong has made some little noises about, oh, that's bad and all that, but they've never even done that before. So is there something going on or are they just showing yeah. up? Well, the State Department Counselor Derek Chalet is, was either there or is about to be there um, this week uh, talking to the Singaporeans. I, I don't know what's in his talking points, but I would imagine that he will be raising these things and maybe suggesting some things that Singapore could look at doing. In the past, in my experience, Singapore has always resisted anything that would take away from its reputation as sort of a great international business center. It's kind of like the Swiss, you know, where they don't want to mess with the banking rules because they're all about the banking. So it's it's hard. Um, again, I assume that Derek is talking to the Singaporeans about this, but I don't know um, any details. But even the Swiss at one point, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think it would be, I would love to see the Singaporeans take some specific action, um, you know, whether it's on jet fuel or closing some bank accounts. But my sense is for them, it's a very hard ask because they don't want to do anything that diminishes their sort of role as an international business center. And, and you can agree with that or not, but I, I think that's a factor that's significant for them. Okay, I'm going to read a, one of the questions from the chat, and John, maybe you can um, pass the mic down to the woman. Um, we had a question, right? Yeah. Okay, for the next question. Um, so there is a question about um, how the U.S. can assist the various Southeast Asian countries struggling with China's assertive Southeast Asian policy, with sort of mix of bilateral and multilateral policy in the workplace. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I sorry, I think I didn't fully answer one of the earlier questions, which is related to this about you know what if the countries raise China. Um, when I said we shouldn't be talking about China, my point is we shouldn't be going out there to Jakarta, KL, Phnom Penh, and say let's talk about China. It may come up. Certainly, if other countries raise it, we shouldn't be uh, averse to talking about it. Um, I think my, I think a key argument in the book is that. The U.S. goal in Southeast Asia from a geostrategic point of view should not be winning vis-a-vis -vis China, but rather having good enough relations and being seen as a reliable enough partner in Southeast Asia that it give, it maximizes the freedom of maneuver of countries of Southeast Asia, who might still choose to be very close to China, but our interest should be that they don't do it under duress or because they feel like they have no choice. So I think the first thing that we can do is 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 to have as good a relations and uh, as possible, be as good a partner as possible, so that they have that freedom of maneuver. And then, secondly, um, the more that we're engaging and providing, you know, economic alternatives, uh, like that, that certainly helps. 
um, in the case of, um, I'll give you one example in Myanmar. I put this in the book. I think I did. Um, the Chinese really wanted to build this port on the Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal at Chao Pu. And then they were going to have a road and rail line to it and so on. And the Chinese project was huge. We're going to build this massive port in a part of Myanmar that's really poor. And it was going to basically be really good for Chinese exports and not clear that it was going to be particularly useful for Myanmar. And, but they were put, the Chinese were putting a lot of pressure on Myanmar because this was during the middle of the Rohingya crisis when the government had kind of turned and was relying on China uh, as relations with the West had cooled. And so um, some of the technocrats in the government were very concerned about this project, about the size of it. And so they asked for help quite a bit. And um, we were able through an existing USAID program to provide some money that they could use to hire some independent consultants to help them assess the project and negotiations. These weren't US government officials who were doing it. And um, I think that helped. And as a result, they were able to negotiate to this to a much smaller project that made much more sense for Myanmar and didn't put them at much risk. Um, the Wall Street Journal subsequently reported that they talked to a State Department official who had said that um, State Department had sent a team out there to do this. I was furious because somebody just made that up. I wasn't true at all. I'm not saying the Wall Street Journal made it up. Somebody at the State Department told the Wall Street Journal because they wanted to take credit. Um, I guess I shouldn't be venting about these things. But, you know. but, um, but, but one of the recommendations you make in your book, though, is to try to enhance the capacity of Southeast Asian countries, particularly the yeah. less developed ones like Myanmar, Cambodia, et cetera, yeah. to evaluate these and that right. the U.S. government should find a way to provide technical assistance yeah, we in have, that area and we, build that capacity to create the economy. Right. And absolutely. And it, it shouldn't, it should be a fund that countries can can um would can draw down from to hire, you know, people who are lawyers or project finance experts or what have you. And it, it shouldn't be directed only at Chinese infrastructure uh, funded infrastructure projects. That won't fly. It could be for any infrastructure projects, domestic, Japanese, US funded, whatever. I actually think the Asian Development Bank should do this, but it would take them probably several years to set it up. And in the meantime, maybe the US and Japan could set it up. Um, and I think that could be really helpful so that countries end up um, having access to best expertise and advice as they're going ahead with huge projects uh, to avoid major problems. Okay, thank you. Question here? Yeah, um, this is another sort of ASEAN-related question. Um, given everything that's happened in Myanmar, do you think they should even be part of ASEAN? Is there any discussion in your circles about this? Uh, there's been some talk about whether ASEAN should suspend or, or expel Myanmar. Um, I, I don't have really strong views on it. I mean, I'm not sure the generals care that much. Um, I think it would be a lot more effective, frankly, um, for an ASEAN, or in this case, Indonesia, as the chair of ASEAN, to meet publicly with the national unity government. I think that would be a much stronger message. Um, I mean, generals and, and, and are, are quite xenophobic. Um, and, uh, I'm not saying, I, I don't know, but I would think there's a decent chance they'd be like, ah, oh, we don't really care about joining on being an Aussie on anyway. So to Why me, that you would, they haven't met with the um, I would say I, they haven't met publicly. Um, I think meeting publicly is important to send the message. Um, the national unity government technically wasn't elected but it is dramatically more representative and has dramatically more legitimacy than these generals who seized power after perfectly fine elections in which their proxy party was absolutely trounced. So this kind of fiction that's going on with some countries and sort of pretending like, well, you've got the military on one side and then these other parties on the other side. No, you've got this brutal, horrific military that seized power with no credibility 
against the entire population of the country. And so there's this tendency, and, and diplomats sometimes fall into this, like, well, let's just see if we can get them to talk and compromise. I mean, they're living in fantasy land. Um, all right, I'll stop ranting. Um, <laughs> uh, South China Sea? South China Sea. This is, Tom knows this really well. Another this is really an, a really difficult issue, right? Um, because you have, I mean, it's not unusual for countries to have disagreements over maritime boundaries. Usually those are resolved through negotiations, sometimes through arbitration. But in this case, and you, you know, remember you've got several ASEAN countries who have overlapping claims among themselves. Now, Vietnam and, and Indonesia have just delineated their boundaries, which is a really good step. But then China comes in and says, never mind, it's all ours, just because we say so. Um, and the US approach was to try to raise the reputational cost. I mean, the claim, and back up, the claim of China is outrageous to begin with. But what was <laughs> more problematic was that they were using you know, ships and airplanes to assert sovereignty, uh, to assert this claim, which is very aggressive and very risky, right? So they're basically trying to bully everybody into accepting their claim. Um, and so the US strategy for a long time was raising the reputational cost, uh, which is why we were big supporters of Philippines when the Philippines went to the, uh, took the issue to the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, which ruled in 2015, 2015, what, around 2015, ruled clearly against China, saying that China's claim in effect had no basis in international law. It didn't slow the Chinese down for a, for a heartbeat uh, for a second. Um, so that didn't work. Um, so it's a really tough issue. We've tried as much as possible to get ASEAN to take a tough stance, but First, you've got several Aussie members who aren't directly affected by this, and they've got important relations with China, so they're not wildly enthusiastic. And even those that do have claim, they, they got to be careful. China's huge and it's right there, and it's an important partner, so they have to be a little bit cautious. So the U.S. has been doing these freedom of navigation operations, which we do elsewhere in the world, basically saying, despite what China says, these are international waterways and we will continue to sail and fly through them just to show so that China can't do just a fait accompli, a search for control. Um, resolving it, I don't have an answer for you, um, other than making sure you do everything possible every day to show by action that China doesn't have control. Um, uh, uh, de facto control of the South China Sea and bolstering the maritime capacity of the ASEAN climate states, not so they can get into a conflict with China, which nobody wants, but so they at least can see and react to what's happening in their waters um, and, and be a presence in their waters, which makes it much harder for China. But a long-term answer, I think, the ASEANs are, are supporting this negotiations on a code of conduct, sort of how everyone behaves until this is finally resolved. Um, they've been negotiating this for a long time. I don't think China has any interest in, in concluding those negotiations because that it, a successful negotiations will probably hurt China, right? They've got it better without that. But ASEAN doesn't have anything else, so that's what they're sticking with. Um, so it's a really thorny issue, and I don't have an answer. Okay. Uh, we have Wait for the mic, please, so the audience can hear you. Thank Great. you. So you made a good point earlier about how changing administrations within the U.S. obviously had different uh, approaches to politics in the Southeast Asian region. In that same way, changing uh, changing regimes or, or democratically elected governments in these countries themselves ones who were not, uh, didn't seize power in a coup, but were simply democratically elected and do not want to work with the U.S., whether they want to work with China or not, how does the U.S. deal with a country who does not want to work with us? Yeah. Um, well, you can't force a country to, to work with you, or at least you shouldn't try. Um, I mean, a good example probably is the Philippines under President Duterte, who was, you know, had a personal animus to the United States. Um, 
and that resulted in you know some some difficult times. Um, but there's still a lot that you can do. You can still do scholarship programs. Um, you can still uh, support environmental work. You can still work on uh, other aspects of diplomacy. You can still carry out trade. Um, so there's a lot that can be done. But you, know, you just have to recognize that you know certain things of particularly elected leader and says, hey, I don't want to work for the United States. Okay. Uh, obviously, you try to engage and do what you can to soften that a little bit. And then meanwhile, you find the areas where you can work. And they're usually a lot. I mean, in the Philippines, it was some of these areas because the Philippines as a whole is very pro U.S. So there were a lot of people to work with. But business, um, education, uh, those areas are hugely important. I want to say something complimentary message. Um, I think the Obama administration did a great job when Duterte was president because uh, a lot of things could have gone a lot worse. And sometimes uh, the best diplomats do their best work in preventing things from getting worse rather than uh, maintaining good relations with a government that dislikes them. And one, two things that didn't happen under Duterte was the uh, enhanced defense cooperation agreement that Ambassador Marcial uh, mentioned uh, was maintained despite all the tension and the status of force agreements for when U.S. forces visit the Philippines were maintained despite all the tension in the relationship. That could have gone a different way if the U.S. diplomats were not successful. And, and Scott was one of those diplomats in East Asia Pacific Affairs Bureau that kept the long term relationship with the country alive, even though we had a government that we didn't like. It's easy to get a lot of people who like you. <laughs> yeah. and, and usually, if I could just add, usually, I mean, take Hun Sen, Prime Minister Hun Sen of Cambodia. It's no secret that he's not a huge fan of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but we still can do a lot, and we do do a lot with, with Cambodia. Um, Hun Sen came to the White House um, <clears throat> early this year when President Biden, no, I mean, I think he wanted a trip to the White House maybe for a long time. Um, but it was interesting. This is a small thing, but the video of the, of the photo op, because every Aussie on meeting has to have a photo <laughs> op. They're out on the White House lawn on a little elevated platform. And uh, after the um, photo, they're all exiting, going down a few, um, few steps. There's a, there's a video showing President Biden taking Hun Sen's arm and helping him down the steps. I thought that was wonderful. Right. Okay. I'm not saying therefore Hun Sen became the, the biggest fan of the United States, but um, treating people with respect is important. Now, you know, if if people cross a certain line in terms of how badly they behave in terms of human rights abuses, you can argue about that. But um, I, I think little things matter. Well, it's interesting that you brought up Hun Sen because the next question was from Eve Zucker. Um, so go ahead, Eve. Yes, it was a, it was a perfect it was a perfect opening actually. <laughs> so I just briefly, um, I was wondering if um, I would love to hear your perspective on the upcoming election in Cambodia that's happening in July, and with certain expected results, as I'm sure you know, there's an expectation that his son Hanmanet will come be the next in power. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that and whether you can anticipate any likely outcomes after the election as well. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, first, I have to say that the prosecution and sentencing of Kim Soka is, you know, without is stating the obvious, really troubling. Um, longtime opposition leader, political figure um, who, I, who I know quite well. Um, is, is really troubling. And, and Hun Sen has definitely narrowed the political and the democratic space in the country significantly. There were times under his rule where there was you know, a reasonable amount of space. It was never perfect. And now he's narrowed it uh, to the point that I, I think most are expecting the Cambodian uh, um, People's Party to win uh, uh, easily in the elections. And I'm not quite sure you know, procedurally, how his son, Hun Manet, will um, uh, come to power. It sounds like Hun Sen's been doing a lot of work within the CPP to pave the way for that. Um, you know, some people make a big deal about Hun Manet having been educated at West Point and, you know, et cetera. Um, 
I think, again, the United States should, you know, keep engaging, keep the door open. And when I say, you know, engaging with Hun San or Hun Manette, but also with opposition figures. Um, um, I think, as, as we've seen with Bong Bong Marcos, I, I'm not predicting this. I'm just saying that you don't know. Everyone's different. And I would assume that this is speculation that Hun Sen will be kind of helping advise his son for some time. But, you know, people, I, I think we should be, make sure that we're well-placed should there be some adjustments and some changes in thinking. You want to be well-placed. Um, this was really the argument, if I can go back to you, Mark, in 2009 when the Obama team came in. Um, I sent memo to the incoming Secretary of State basically arguing that we should change our approach on Myanmar away from just sanctions to not dropping the sanctions but being more open to engagement not because that would change things but because then we would be better placed if things did begin to move so I think continuing to engage and keeping that door open it may lead nowhere but you at least don't want to miss an opportunity should one arise Okay, um, we have maybe two or three minutes left. Can I just ask you a question? When you talk a lot about Singapore and Vietnam working in Washington very well and other countries not, um, can you give us some examples of what exactly you mean by that? Yeah, um, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a simplification, but um, Vietnam and Singapore um, always have very active diplomats um, in in Washington who really get around, meet lots of people, uh, develop relations, and work the relationship hard. I mean, they're constantly going out and meeting. Some other governments um, take a little bit quieter approach. Um, I mean, we used to joke, I don't remember this in in Washington, that you know, if the South Koreans wanted to a, a visit, the South Korean diplomats would be in knocking, pounding on doors everywhere in Washington. And Southeast Asians, it's maybe it's a cultural thing, will tend to be like, well, it'd be nice if we got an invitation. <laughs> um, so the Vietnamese and Singaporeans are a little bit more, I don't, I say aggressive, but not in the bad sense of the word, they're just really um, assertive in that sense. Um, they also make a real effort to get senior level meetings, including having their senior people come uh, to, to Washington. And then when senior people go to Singapore and Vietnam, they rarely come back complaining that it was a waste of time. Uh, so there is, you know, there's a lot of work done to, I mean, if you're gonna have a presidential level visit or even a secretary level visit, you wanna sort of make it worthwhile. And that requires a lot of preparation, a lot of organization. <clears throat> the Singaporeans and the Vietnamese tend to be really good at that. Uh, and other countries in Southeast Asia, it's a little bit more inconsistent, I guess I would say, or sometimes not pushing like, hey, we want to send our prime minister there. Um, let's let's make this happen. So, um, and, and, you know, again, and my experience with the Vietnamese is I, I remember uh, when I first was on, I was a director of the Maritime Southeast Asia, I mean, sorry, Mainland Southeast Asia office, which covers Mainland Southeast Asia, obviously. Second day on the job, the political council of the Vietnamese embassy calls me and says, hey, my name's Kui from the Vietnamese embassy. Can I take you out for some pho? Sure. Kui picks me up, takes me out for pho. We talk. And he calls me probably two or three times a week after that. We become good friends. He later went on to head the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. And then up until last year was the UN uh, Vietnamese ambassador to the UN just really good and active. And some other colleagues from the region are really good and really nice people, but you don't hear from them too much. Um, and in Washington, because everybody's so busy, you, you kind of have to be the squeaky wheel to get noticed. And um, I think a lot of Southeast Asians, if I can generalize, it's uncomfortable for them to be the squeaky wheel. Yes. All right, well, thank you so much for coming and thank you for 
talking about this fantastic book. I hope everybody goes out and buys it. It's over 500 pages, okay? So you will get your money's worth. And please, oh, I was going to say something nice, but you can go ahead. <laughs> you go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say that, you know, we have un we have young people here. We have master's students here. Uh, we're, you know, we're at the Weatherhead East Asia Institute, but we're also, uh, you know, in the same building as the School of International Public Affairs, and we're training people to become professionals. And when you train to become professionals, you should study the real pros and and study their careers, listen to them, and figure out how you can make a difference in the world. And I can't think of a better example for you to study than Scott Marcio. I was a a privilege and an honor to work with him. We worked pretty closely together, even on the South China Sea before it was a hot topic. We were working on that together, um, and it was a real it was a real privilege and honor to do so. Study him, uh, figure out how to be a, a career public official of the first order, and a, and a, and a, a public servant and a, and a global citizen of the first order. And I think of a, I think of him in all those ways. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank everybody for coming and um, we really appreciate you. And one of the things that he was very kind, it's very humble and self-deprecating when you read the book. He always made time for, you know, scholars and others in his office. And I know many of us also thank you for that. So thank you, Scott, for coming. <laughs>